we're going to do today is uh, very briefly talk about the, the general overview. Why do cats get sick in shelters, right? And, and then we're going to launch into URI, Panluke ringworm, do a little bit of specifics. But what I'm going to do during the URI portion of the talk is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fold in preventative measures into that part of the talk. And those preventative measures uh, are applicable to panluke, they're applicable to, applicable to ringworm, they're applicable to all infectious diseases, but we're going to fold it into URI, and you can imagine why, and we'll talk about why as well. So why do cats get sick in shelters, right? Stress? Yeah, what else? Overcrowding? Poor biosecurity? Yeah, yeah, you should be up here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so why do cats get sick in the shelter? But the thing is, not every cat gets sick in the shelter, right? A lot of cats might, some cats might, depending on your shelter, depending on your housing, your capacity, your sanitation, all of those things. Uh, we know that some cats even get exposed to disease and don't get sick, right? And so it's, it's, sheltering is incredibly fascinating. And I remember reading a, a paper a few years ago about, um, this wasn't, this wasn't about URI, it was about kennel cough, canine infectious respiratory disease, but, but I imagine it is very applicable to URI as well. And it was that the, the um, canine infectious respiratory disease complex, it can't be mimicked in a laboratory because it's not just a, a, a one thing causes X. You know, it's not one factor causes kennel cough. It's this multifactorial situation in the shelter that causes that infectious disease. And the same thing is true for URI, right? It's multifactorial. And so I've put up these, uh, these f factors that all interplay with one another. There are, of course, the different pathogens that we all uh, you know, know about and we're concerned about in the shelter setting. There are other factors, though, right? We know that just because an animal was exposed to one of these pathogens, it doesn't mean they're going to get sick. There are host factors that uh, contribute to whether the animal gets sick, things like age, right? You've, you've seen this many times that often the kittens who have the worst URI, or the cats who have the worst URI are, are kittens, right? And so that's age playing a factor in my immune system's not completely developed yet, uh, I, I'm not as resilient to certain pathogens, and I'm more likely to get uh, more severely ill. Same with the degree of stress, um, the de their general medical state, did you come in medically compromised? Or are you pretty robust? If you're pretty robust, you're going to hopefully fight off exposure more so than uh, a sick animal would be. But then there's a whole other set of factors which we are constantly dealing with in the shelter, was, which is all of these environmental factors or husbandry factors, right? Um, you mentioned crowding, sanitation, biosecurity. Uh, I put up here as well, ventilation, air quality, the type of housing we have, how we use our housing, all of those things interplay, right? And um, I'm sure tons of, we can talk about tons of examples, but, but I'll give you an example. Um, when we are crowded, we might not have our uh, portals open for our double compartment cages for cats, and so we've closed our portals, which means that what happens now? That means that every time we go to clean a cat's cage, we move that cat out, we stress it, we expose it to potential fomite transmission, we uh, have to, we double the amount of time we use for cleaning, because now we got to go put that cat into something, a different cage or a carrier, we have to clean that cage, go back and clean the other cage that that animal was in, whatever that looks like. So we've also reduced our relative staffing capacity. So if I'm, if, if I'm a staff member and I'm cleaning on it in the morning and I have, I'm typically used to I don't know, 30, 40 cats on site a day, but we are in a situation where we have a lot more cats and now we're dealing with 60 to 80 cats a day, there's still the same number of us cleaning. There's still only two or three of us cleaning, but now we have double the amount of animals. And, you know, it will be very hard for me to do as thorough of a job as I would want to do if there's double the amount of animals I have to clean. So I'm probably going to cut some corners where I can. So that's one example, but I bet y'all can think of many examples where all of these environmental factors, which 
the truth is they all revolve around crowding. They all revolve around capacity for care. Because when you're crowded, all of these other factors then get compromised, right? So, so these are the, the different factors that interplay with one another that result in certain animals getting sick and create kind of the population dynamics for infectious diseases in your shelter. Let's launch into upper respiratory infection. Uh, you can imagine why I've put this first, because how many folks out there battle URI? Everyone's hand is up. Yes, right. It's, it is ubiquitous. The good news is that we have, um, every year we get better and better. We learn more and more about how to combat URI, how to prevent URI, even more so than how to treat URI. We want to focus on preventing URI because that's the key here. But everyone has seen this type of scenario, right? Uh, so let's talk about URI. I, th I think everyone is, is up to speed on this, right? URI in the shelter. So endemic URI is so, so closely related to stress. The reason is not clearly defined, but very interesting, I should say that. There are some theories that just say, actually stress, the cortisol, the hormone itself, can induce herpes virus. It can activate herpes virus. It starts replicating. Um, and it, it, herpes virus is the main pathogen uh, attributed to shelter URI. Uh, but it, it's interesting. Other folks, other theories are that cortisol and stress uh, negatively impact your immune system, so then you can't fight off disease as well. So different theories, but they're probably a mixture is the truth behind that. But what we know is that endemic shelter URI is driven by herpes virus. And stress is so important here because stress, stress is very directly related to activating herpes virus, causing immune res, immune, um, uh, your immune system to be debilitated, and then you manifest signs of URI. And so how many folks in, this, in, in your shelter, you kind of have an idea of when a cat will get URI after it enters your shelter? Yeah, like what would the average day, length of stay be? Or into your shelter length of stay? I'm sorry, I thought you meant like what, what do you see in the cat that makes you ah. expect they're gonna get URI? Right, so that's one part of it. The question I was asking is, uh, do you feel that at your shelter, it's like on day three, on day four, on day seven, I'm more, that's when cats start breaking with URI. Do you feel like you have an average length of stay that cats start breaking? So somewhat. So it depends. You know, it depends on your population dynamics, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit. But let's just talk about cat stressors. There could probably be... <laughs> hundreds of things here, but I've tried to capture the big categories, right? I've tried to capture the big categories of what, cap, what stresses cats out. And the, the problem with this is that all of these things are happening in the shelter every day, right? All of these things. Uh, I used to live outside and now I'm in a cage. So whatever my routine is, is totally turned upside down. I used to be in a home and I used to get loved and petted. And now the, sometimes the only times I get uh, interacted with is to get a vaccine or a microchip or to get pilled, something like that. So increased negative social contact, reduced positive social contact. I, was, I had certain bonds, human or other animal bonds. Those have been disrupted. Think about this one, unfamiliar noises and odors. That's, that's common even in the fanciest shelters out there. This is a big one, being moved. And so think about this though, being moved isn't just I went from a home to a cage. Being moved is also, I get, my cage gets cleaned every day and I have to get moved multiple times a day. That's a risk factor. Actually, that's one of the biggest risk factors that studies have shown is that in the first week of being in your shelter, one of the biggest risk factors for you or I is how many times the cat gets moved in that first week. And that's just not moved from ward A to ward B. We want to minimize those moves, but it's also how many times that I get moved from in and out of my cage over and over again. And that's why that double compartment housing or portalized housing is so innovative and so useful now because that means we just don't have to stress the cat out as much. And then of course, right, this is just inherent in our work, in the good work we're trying to do, but it is a challenge. 
So you can imagine that all of these things are cat stressors, and they're, 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 they're partly working towards uh, causing herpes to either re-manifest itself, or um, if an animal is exposed to herpes brand new in the shelter, they're more likely to get sick from it because of these stressors. So this is important because I know we have staff, I know we have volunteers, and, and I really want to relay that you are the first line of defense in recognizing stress in animals, right? And so, ma'am, over here you were saying, how do you know if an animal might be getting you or I, or what does that look like? And I want to briefly comment on this, because this is important for, for all of us to recognize. And I think, again, every, everyone who works in a shelter should be cognizant of what stress looks like in a cat, because it can look very different, right? It can look like this. It can look like, I'm crying out, I'm crying out, I'm crying out. I was at a shelter the other day where, um, you know what, they didn't really have the capacity to hold on to surgical cases post-operatively. They were just supposed to be a spay-neuter clinic, but y'all can imagine, you know, I'm sure many of us have done this, where a cat came in, it needed an enucleation, so they did the enucleation, and then they kept the kitty in a really tiny cage that was supposed to be basically like a pre-op, post-op cage, but they kept the kitty in there because they were wanting to let its eye healed. And when I walked in, I realized that, you know, what some folks might think of as, oh, this is cute, this cat's clawing at the cage door, to us is, oh my gosh, this cat is in its prime age for needing socialization. It's stuck in a teeny tiny cage that was supposed to just be meant for overnight or day stay because it was a surgical cage. And it's crying out because it's totally alone and it's going to sit here for about 10 or 14 days by when it, while its eye heals on its own, right? And if you think about the prime socialization period for kittens, it is a short window. It's like three weeks to seven weeks is actually the, 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 the main age. And then after that, they're still pretty uh, receptive to socialization and development, but it starts to kind of fall off, right? So that those peak ages that they're with us when they're about eight weeks old, 10 weeks old, this kitty was probably a few weeks old, those are still really important for social development. So that kitty was crying out because it was stressed, you know? It wasn't a cute, it wasn't a cute gesture, it was stressed. And so I, I, I did, of course, I, th th those things to me when I go to a shelter consult, I, I speak up and I say something and I say, you know guys, I don't know why this kitty is here based on protocol or policy or maybe you don't have foster capacity to send this kitty out, but these are the types of things we need to review, and I'm happy to, you know, work through this with you, because this is a cat that needs to not be in your shelter, right, your spay-neuter clinic. This cat can go recover in a foster home or somewhere else where it can be properly socialized and will still be, will be able to heal probably in a faster rate because it's going to be less stressed. So, so we know stress can look like this, right? Stress can also look like, there's a kitty back here actually, they've torn up their cage. This, I'm gonna tell you a really brief story because this broke my heart. There, uh, there's this researcher who does a lot of work on cat stress and um, one of the ways she gauges cat stress is she videos cats, right, all day long in shelters and then she goes back through and she watches those videos to pinpoint different, um, different keys uh, Fact, uh, key markers of stress, right? Like ears down, you know, hiding, hiding behind the litter box, hiding in the litter box, the things that we know of. And one day she told us that she only used to video during the day, right? She would video for a few hours during the day. One day a camera was accidentally left on overnight and she went and looked at that footage. And this is at night when none of us are at the shelter, right? She went and she looked at the footage and she was so heartbroken by, these cats are supposed to be nocturnal, right? You're hoping that they're sleeping and they're resting through the night. But she, what she saw broke her heart. She said so many cats at night become restless, they're tearing up their cages, uh, going bonkers because they're stressed. And she realized that a huge part of her research was, was just totally being missed because she wasn't videoing animals overnight as well. So she was missing a big, a, a big kind of piece of, uh, a, a time piece of, it's really important to understand that uh, we need to also capture cats 
at night and capture their stress levels at night, and that's really helped redirect her, her, her studies, actually. And so how many of us have come in in the morning and cages look like this, right? Right. And that, those are signs of stress. But how many of us have also seen this? So the opposite, right? The opposite. We're tense. We, we're feigning sleep. Um, we're not eating as much. Our, our, the coat starts looking crummy, you know, starts getting dandery, all of these things. Uh, resting in the litter box. So such important signs for staff, for volunteers, for all of us to really pick up on because your first line of defense. And there are shelters I go to where I'm a big advocate of every single cat, no matter what ward you're in, deserves a hide box. Every single cat deserves some type of way to hide or some type of option to hide. And that could be a curtain on part of the cage, a hide box, a perch with a towel over it, whatever that looks like, whatever your shelter can manage. Every single cat deserves that because every single cat deserves the option, the choice to hide if it needs to hide. And so say you work in a shelter and you're volunteering at a shelter and, and leadership just isn't into the idea of hide boxes because they say, well, if we give them hidey boxes, then they're just hiding and they're never going to get adopted. Then you can go to them and say, I've seen this cat. It's trying to hide in its litter box. It's trying to hide behind its litter box. Or you know what? Its cage looks like this in the morning. This cat needs the option of being able to hide because that's the only way it's ever going to eventually present better and more appropriately in its cage if you ever want to get this cat adopted. So, so important that uh, we all are very uh, cognizant of these stress identifiers. Okay, transmission of disease. This is the first thing right up here. Reactivation by stress. I know that's not exactly transmission, but that is the primary way that URI develops in the shelter. Many, many cats are already harboring herpes virus when they come in, but they're healthy. Uh, it, it's actually kind of like many of us harbor the chickenpox virus, right? Like if we had the chickenpox when we were young, it's, it actually stays in our nerves. And we might not get any symptoms from it again, but sometimes when we're older or we're stressed, it remanifests as shingles because we're stressed. So it's the same, it's a very similar concept with herpes. Not all cats develop URI signs, even if they're harboring the disease inside their nerves but many of them will when reactivated by stress. And the reason I asked earlier is, do you have a ballpark of when URI strikes at your shelter or breaks, is because there's a very kind of concrete phase. It's usually within four to 11 days. So a cat enters the shelter, becomes stressed, oh, excuse me, and then they manifest with signs of URI in about four to 11 days. If it's a brand new infection, they'd never had herpes virus, they were just exposed to it, maybe in your shelter, right? Because the herpes virus is in every shelter. Khaleesi virus is in every shelter. It's just not every cat manifests those signs. It's in every shelter because even healthy animals carry those pathogens. But if the healthy animal is exposed to it for the first time, then that incubation period is a little different. And so, you know, you can kind of gauge cats are uh, getting stress is reactivating herpes virus or we're getting new cases of herpes virus. So you can kind of gauge that. Other, other transmission routes of herpes, Khaleesi, some of the other pathogens that contribute to URI are going to be mycoplasma. They're going to be sometimes but rarely Bordetella. Uh, things like chlamydia sometimes also uncommon but can happen. Unlike dogs, Aerosolization, aerosolization isn't important, and the main reason is just cats don't have the lung capacity to cough up and aerosolize pathogens. Dogs can aerosolize pathogens up to 25 feet. Cats just can't. They don't have the lung reserves and the capacity. But droplet transmission up to five feet is, is, a, is a real thing. And then fomites. Y'all have seen this picture probably if you were with me earlier, but fomites. So, this is important to me here. You know, I, I think it's important. I like cages like this. I know, you know, uh, folks have different cages now, sometimes plexiglass covering. I'll be honest, I still like stainless steel because stainless steel is, is hard, it's sturdy, it's hardy, easy to clean. 
I like stainless steel too because the kitty can do this. And the kitty can reach out and the kitty can say, take me home today. I still like that very much. And I put this here because direct contact, because fomite, fomites, we're the culprits to fomites. People being able to touch healthy cats, that's much less of a concern of fomite transition. So I, I encourage people to say, if you have an adoption ward of healthy cats, and you've set your shelter up for success, you're vaccinating on intake, your staff and volunteers are promptly recognizing disease. If a cat does get diseased, you, you promptly isolate it. If you're setting your shelter up for success with good sanitation, then I say let the people pet the cats. That's what helps cats get home, right? That's what helps cats get into a home. So I'm a big advocate of that. Okay, everyone has seen this, right? Just, I mean, this cat just looks unhappy. Uh, this cat just looks miserable. You can imagine it's probably similar to when you or me, we have a cold and we just want to be left in bed and watch Netflix. Uh, <laughs> you know, this cat is like, leave me alone, I want to watch Netflix. Uh, but you've also seen this. This is painful, right? But you know what? This is painful too. They're both painful. And so um, all of us have seen these clinical signs. I won't go into it. One interesting uh, comment is if you do see cats coughing, that's not as common, right? That's not as common of a sign. So double check. Those are when you might say we need to do chest. You might recommend to the vet or your med staff, hey, I saw this cat coughing a little more or it's a little bizarre. And that should hopefully raise a red flag of maybe we need to do x-rays, make sure this kitty doesn't have pneumonia or something else going on. URI treatment. This is, this is the, 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 the main concept here, minimize patient stress and discomfort. And, and this is where uh, staff and volunteers are really paramount. The URI is, is driven by stress. It's primarily herpes virus. There are bacteria that create secondary infections, right? So when you have the cat with the green uh, snot coming out, the yellowish discharge, you know that that's, there's a secondary bacterial component on top of that virus, right? And that's when we reach for antibiotics. But it is really important in the shelter setting to minimize stress and how much we actually have to handle the cat. That's probably the most important component of treatment because for most cats, the disease is gonna be self-limiting. Self you know, they're gonna run their course over a few days. Uh, when they have that secondary infection, of course, we need to treat them with antibiotics, but for the most part, they're going to self-limit as long as we provide uh, kind of like minimal, I like to think of it as less is more, minimal supportive care. And, and I'll talk about this a bit, you know. There are things like minim maintaining hydration, and we don't always think of that, but that's important. You know, when we have a cold, uh, we're losing a lot of fluids through coughing, through sneezing, uh, and that's, it's, it's really important to keep your respiratory tract hydrated so you can actually keep coughing and, and getting, you know, getting stuff up out of your respiratory tract. So maintaining hydration is really important because we know lots of cats stop eating when they're sick, right? So reaching for fluids, if you're staff or if you're helping, reaching for fluids is sometimes really important because we want these cats to stay hydrated. So sub-Q fluids is is often really important and it will expedite uh, a treatment. Things like promoting nutrition, uh, and y'all know this, warming up hot smelly food because one of the first things that happens is their nose gets clogged up and they can't smell anything. So hot, you know, really gross smelling food that they love, hand feeding them, trying to promote positive plane of nutrition is really important, again, to expedite how fast they clear URI. When needed, we'll treat with bacterial, we'll treat bacterial infections. First line of defense is, is gonna always be doxy. And the reason it's always gonna be doxy is because doxy is once a day, so that's less stressful, right, than having to pill them twice or put medicine down them twice. Doxy is less likely to cause diarrhea compared to something like Clavamox, thank goodness. Uh, Doxy has really good eye penetration. So I mention all of this because of this. You don't have to, if when you reach, when the doctors and the medical staff reach for Doxy, that's great. 
because Doxy has good eye penetration, so you don't have to double up on eye drops or eye ointment. And think of how great that is. That means I don't have to go in, grab the kitty, and you know, put eye stuff in it. And that, again, is minimizing stress for the cat. So, so important from a variety of ways. Doxycycline is also just anti-inflammatory in nature, so that helps too. So lots of good reasons for Doxy. Respiratory guidelines in veterinary medicine recently came out, and doxycycline is noted as the best first-line defense for uh, run-of-the-mill URI. Things like lysine, I, I just talked about eye ointments, lysine. Lysine, has, lysine was pretty common. It might still be used at some of your shelters, but lysine has been proven time and time again to just not be effective. And I, and I put this up here because I want you all to think of the fact that if you're having to give the kitty light, like a bolus of lysine, that's stressful, and you're, you're, you're handling the animal, things like that, so it's just not worth it because lysine has just been proven not to be effective. Yes? Can you actually make a powder binding into our dry Yes. So all of our cats get sure. Lysine mixed in Sure, so she was saying, you know, we mix in powdered lysine into our food, so every, everyone gets it. Uh, so I'll, I'll mention this. It's, uh, it's probably... Not a good use of your money. I don't know how expensive it is, but it, it's probably not a good use of money because there's no evidence for it actually helping. And I will say this. There's been one study that showed not the powder, but when you bolused kitties with the lysine gel, that that actually resulted in more URI. And the interpretation we, from that was that, again, handling the cat over and over again to bolus it was probably more stressful. So there's probably no harm in giving like the powdered up lysine in the, in the food, but there's no benefit, almost hands down, no study has shown any benefit. So probably not a good use of money. So I'm gonna put that up here too, so important that uh, minimizing amount of stress is so important. Things like if you're treating or if you're helping with treatment, even things like the same person being on treatment is valuable to the cat. Just just the cat knowing who's going to come, who's, who's come to the front of their cage the next day and the next day has been shown to be uh, less stressful for the cat. Treating at the same time each day, just like feeding at the same time each day, all of these things that, that build some type of predictability and sense of control for the cats is what we're looking for. So as, as staff and as volunteers, keep that in mind that this cat is in this cage against its will, right? And so the best thing, the most we can do is try to build some semblance of predictability and control for that cat. So the things we can do are uh, spot cleaning so we don't ruffle up its house every day, try to treat it and feed it at the same time, things like turning the lights on and off at the same time, the things we would do for our own cats at home, right? We fall into a routine and the right like my cat wakes me up every single morning she jumps up she wakes me up because she's in a routine and that that I imagine helps her feel like she knows what's going to happen the rest of the day um, that's even more important for the cat who's stuck in a cage in the, in the shelter until it can get out to a home uh, really important so same caregiver same routine really important biosecurity and isolation uh, I'm going to say this, that if, you're, if, 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 if you have isolation, you want to move cats with URI, especially cats that have signs of secondary infection and who are on antibiotics into isolation. And that's really important uh, just for antibiotic resistance issues, things like salmonella can overgrow. When you give cats antibiotics, it can cause salmonella in their bacterial, in their gut tract to overgrow, and then you can get a salmonella issue. So those are things you want to isolate into a separate ward. You don't ever want to have animals on antibiotics regularly in your adoption ward. So really important to remember that. But the thing is, once they've clinically resolved, the amount of pathogen they're shedding has decreased significantly. So you don't have to keep that cat back in isolation for, you know, some minimum uh, amount of time. You know, it's, there's not a minimum amount of you have to be back in ISO for two weeks. 
It's really important that as staff and as volunteers, you monitor the cats every day. You ensure that they're improving every day. If they're not, you, you flag it for your medical staff and that you are able to tell your DVM or your med staff, this cat has significantly improved and it's ready to move out. Because again, y'all are the first line of defense in saying this cat's readily improved, it hasn't shown clinical signs for X amount of days. The likelihood that it's shedding contagious pathogens is significantly low. The best thing we can do for this cat and for our whole population is to get this cat moved through our system. So really important there. I love spot cleaning, so I put that there. When I am in URI ward, I'm going to wear gloves. I'm going to wear a separate smock so that when I go out to general population after that, I don't have those pathogens on me. So I'm going to make sure I protect my hands. I'm going to protect my, my top at least, so I, and I'm going to change my top or take off my you know, PPE, whatever I'm wearing. A little bit about disinfectants. Herpes is really easy to get rid of with any disinfectant. Khaleesi is the hardier one. So Khaleesi is a non-enveloped virus. Khaleesi is the one you want to use something like trifectant or rescue, or we spoke about this morning, if you're using a product like bleach, you just got to make sure that you use a cleaner first, and then you apply your bleach at the right dilution to make sure it gets your pathogens. But yes, bleach, whizzy wash, they'll, they'll get Khaleesi too. But I mentioned this earlier, I avoid bleach and I avoid quats, and I recommend that because they are respiratory irritants. So you already have kitties who have irritated tracheas, irritated eye membranes, nose membranes. You don't want to add on something on top of that that irritates them even more. So in general, avoiding those irritants. Vaccination. The deal with vaccination here is that FERCP is terrific against protecting pan -lug, against pan -lug. It's not as terrific against herpes virus and Khaleesi virus, but still really important because it can help decrease the severity of disease. So it won't prevent URI, but it'll decrease the severity of disease, and it'll typically decrease the duration of disease. And so it's still so important to, of course, vaccinate. The main reason it's important is for pan loop, but it's just as important for upper respiratory disease in cats too. I've put the general shelter medicine uh, best practices and guidelines for vaccination, all kitties over four weeks, as soon as possible to intake. You don't want to wait any hours. Uh, if you have underage kittens, how often you're going to vaccinate every two to three weeks until they're about four and a half, five months old. And you're always going to booster your adults in two weeks. This booster, this booster is not to booster Panluc. Panluc's vaccine is terrific. So Panluc, you give them one vaccine, an adult should be protected within three to five days if, they're, if they respond to the vaccine normally. This vaccine is really because herpes and Khaleesi is a crummy vaccine. And so we give them that second booster to help give them a little oomph in protection against upper respiratory. So this is a little portion where we'll go through URI prevention. I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to laboriously go over all of this, but I, it's so important to me to touch on it because, as we talked about, URI management has really changed focus from how do we treat, how do we treat, how do we treat to how do we prevent because we know we can prevent it now. And I have to start with, of course, the five freedoms because. What does reducing stress mean? Reducing stress means we are upholding the five freedoms for every cat in every part of the shelter. If you're in stray hold, if you're in adoptions, if you're in quarantine, you're in isolation, we, we do our best to provide the five freedoms to every single cat. This is a long list, but we've talked about a lot of it. We want to reduce shelter length of stay. I had a graph in here, but uh, I figured I'd just talk about it anyways. A study showed that just the more days cats stayed in the shelter, the likelihood of getting URI just it exponentially increases. And so that's related to stress, that's related to exposure. But you know too that the longer each animal stays, that means the larger our daily, daily inventory grows, right? So longer length of stay is more exposure for the cat, more stress for the cat, but it also uh, it, it's also bad for our population because that means we just have more and more animals on site every day. So 
working towards reducing our length of stay with uh, smart population management strategies, adoption strategies, intake prevention strategies, or intake management strategies, so important. We talked about these other things, avoiding crowding, the importance of uh, use good housing where we can just shift a cat over, spot clean around it, hide areas, minimizing necessary movement. So, of course, separating dogs from cats, the, just the noise, routine care enrichment. So I'm just going to go over a few things. Kelly Bolin is here. She's terrific if you've gone to some of her talks. But I, you know, I, I, I stole this from her because I love it. More space, more choices, more stimulation. Because again, what can we do to provide this cat with a sense of predictability, a sense of control? And these are just some photos from her, you know, uh, staff and volunteers, uh, y'all can, if you don't have these types of projects or programs at your shelter, you can advocate for them. Uh, food toys, just straight up old school playing with the cat. This, even things like uh, cats need, uh, a study showed that cats need at least three inches of bedding to, to achieve REM sleep, to achieve really deep sleep. So those are things that you can, you can say, hey guys, we need extra padding here because because we know that cats, you know, they sleep best and they rest best if we can give them extra padding. I love outdoor catios, so wonderful enrichment. Target, you know, click, uh, clicker training and target training is awesome. Things like this to just play with cats. You know, you all have heard a lot of these things, so I'm not going to labor over them, but so important. It, they, it can't be understated, but. Here are some options. You know, this shelter, uh, talking a little bit about housing, this shelter wanted to give this cat a Heidi box, right? But in giving it a Heidi box, this cat can't move now. <laughs> so what's one way to fix that is some volunteers or, uh, a, you know, I've had, uh, y'all have probably had this, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts come in. They make a bunch of mini Corunda beds. This is beautiful. The cat can, can perch on top, which they want. You can drape a towel over and they can hide under behind it if they want to. So, you know, if you don't have uh, what would be ideal housing, which would be bigger housing, double compartment housing, you can still manage and try to prevent uh, and try to manage the stress that comes along with housing by, with some of these techniques. I like these too because, again, this kitty, today she feels like being here. Tomorrow she might be over here, and that's okay. That's okay, because that's going to keep her healthy, and that's going to keep her, uh, be, that's going to make her present better, actually, for adopters as well. But little curtains, I'm sure every shelter has some version of, of Heidi boxes. I, you know, this is a pretty cool group housing space because everything in this room is disinfectable. And the things that aren't disinfectable are washable. And then I don't have a photo of this, but on the other side, there were tons of uh, like things that they could scratch on that weren't cloth, right? Because you can't disinfect cloth. So, but there were a bunch of scratch pads and different things that if they needed to, they could dispose of. Like if ringworm broke out in here, they could dispose of those scratch pads, right? They didn't have to throw away huge fancy cat trees. They could just throw away those scratch pads and then wash everything and disinfect everything. So, you know, beautiful. Um, example of vertical enrichment, um, different types, really welcoming. You can imagine at this shelter, this was the uh, room that cats got adopted out the fasted because people loved this room. People loved this room and the cat stayed healthy. And then this final plug here on sufficient space, which is that uh, studies have shown that this is the amount of space per cat that we need to provide 11 square feet per cat. Uh, and it's really kind of anywhere between 9 to 11 square feet per cat to try to provide best practice or best, uh, best practices for cats. And really important here, the square footage isn't, is, it, is, is important, but the height is too, right? We have to allow cats to be able to appropriately posture when they uh, use their litter box. Those are things that enhance the five freedoms, uphold the five freedoms, so really important. If you're in communal housing, you need a lot more space because those cats need to be able to get away from one another, right? So 18 square feet per cat. So you got to make sure you allow for stretching and posturing. 
uh, so I should explain this. Say you have a pod or a room, right? That's your kind of communal room. OK. You would measure how much square footage is in there. And then you would divide by 18, and that would give you how many cats you can put into that room. Does that make sense? OK. And so uh, you know, if you have, what's 18 times 3? Uh, 54. If you had a room that was 54 square feet, you would know that 54 divided by 18 is three cats. And, and I'll, give, I'll do this a little plug very briefly. Say you're ever working in a shelter or you're ever part of helping to, uh, uh, you know, your shelter's getting a new facility. Really important that communal rooms be smaller. It, always better to have smaller but more communal rooms instead of big, big communal rooms. And the idea is you want to limit how many animals you put into a communal room. There is a minimum square footage per cat, of course, but also just in theory, right? Every time, if you have one of these big communal cat rooms where there's eight or ten cats, that's stressful because every time you put a new cat in there, it disrupts whatever social hierarchy had been developed. It's also, when you have big communal rooms like that, and in, there's some infectious disease that does break, that's a lot of cats that got exposed as opposed to two or three when you have smaller communal rooms. So really important if you think of shelter facility design to always uh, look for smaller communal rooms than bigger communal rooms. It's less stressful for the cats. Uh, sometimes you can do all in, all out. You know, put three cats in there, wait till they get all adopted out, and then put your next three in, whatever that looks like. So it, it breaks kind of that infectious disease chain of transmission if you do have something. So smaller numbers are always better. For the last few minutes, we'll talk about panluc, and then we'll, we'll try to touch on ringworm. So many of us have seen this, right? The kitty looked great, and then really suddenly the kitty did not look great. And that's hallmark for panluc, is sudden death or sudden severe illness. Sudden severe illness. So this is one of these non-enveloped viruses that's really very hardy. So again, you need something like rescue, trifectant, or bleach that's being used properly with the detergent. A quaternary ammonium won't get this, pro won't get this virus, so, so don't reach for that. We know that it's highly contagious, fecal, oral, and fomite transmission, because again, it's really hardy. So if you get it on your smock or your scrub top, uh, or your shirt, it's going to hang out on your clothes for a while. And if you go and touch uh, and handle a kitten that's super susceptible to it, you're going you're gonna to likely transmit it, right? Uh, unfortunately, a high mortality rate, very persistent. Like we said, vaccine is very protective. And I put an asterisk here. Vaccine is very protective, of course. But the key here is vaccinating on intake. And this is so amazing to me. The vaccine starts kicking in within hours. The Panluc vaccine and the distemper vaccine, the, the, those two components of those two separate vaccines, distemper and Panluc, they start working within hours. So always remember, you know, when you're working in a shelter, it's so critical not to delay vaccination on intake because you, you might have just missed a few hours of protection. And in those hours of protection, that animal could have gotten exposed to something. So vaccinating immediately on intake is so important because these vaccines we have are really protective and really help, really good, and their onset is very fast, especially for panluc and distemper. So you don't want to waste any time. Who can get FBP panluc? Any unvaccinated cat. And this is interesting. A, shut, a study done in Florida, where they they took blood from cats that were in, coming into the shelter to see how many cats were protected against panluc. Up to 40% of cats, uh, only 40% had protection against panluc. That means 60% of cats coming into the shelter in Florida were not protected. So again, so important to get that vaccine on quickly so you can start providing protection. Kittens, of course, we know are most susceptible because maybe their mama gave them some antibodies when they were nursing on them, but maybe not. We don't know what their mama gave to them through their milk, right? We don't know. So that's why kittens are just always considered the highest risk, because we never know uh, how much antibody they had from their mama, and we never know. We keep vaccinating until they're a certain amount of age, so we know that the vaccine kicks in. And then just in general, 
Why do we see so much pan luke during kitten season? Why do we see so much ringworm? It's just that out in the environment, out in the community, there's just a much higher population of susceptible animals because that's when more and more kittens are born, right? This is a, a kind of makeshift graph up here, but the real reason I put this up here is that if a cat's exposed to pan luke, the incubation period, so the amount of time it might take for that cat to actually break and show signs of pan loop can be up to 14 days. But in general, it's usually going to be somewhere like a week, a few days, five to seven days. So I got exposed to pan loop, I wasn't protected, I'm going to break with it in typically five to seven days, at most 14 days. But what's most important is that I might break with it on day seven, but I could have already been shedding pathogen on, on day three or four. So pan luke's, an animal might not show signs, but it might already be shedding pathogen. So that's why it's so important. Again, first line of defense, when you start, you know the cat's the best in your shelter because you're dealing with them, you're handling them every day, you're working with them every day. When you start noticing something abnormal, diarrhea, a little bit of vomiting, a little bit of lethargy, especially in a kitten, that, that's the first sign of something could be up. And if it's pan luke, this cat could have been shedding two or three days before I first noticed it was sick. So I need to isolate this cat and, and touch base with medical team to figure out what's going on. Clinical signs, we've all seen this, but this is what's most important here. Sudden death. And so if you come into your shelter and you have a cat that kitten that died overnight. If you send a kitten out to foster, the foster says it died abruptly, we don't know why. Your first thought will always be pan luke, pan luke, pan luke, right? It should always be pan luke, and you're always gonna wanna make sure the sta shelter medical staff tests for that. Because your test might be negative, and that doesn't mean it's not pan luke, it might be negative because we caught the cat at a time it wasn't shedding, because it's not always shedding pathogen. Even though it's infected with pan luke, it's not always shedding. It's, it's intermittently shedding it, and it's transiently shedding it. So if that cat died overnight, if that cat looks and you know, it walks and looks and talks like pan luke, even if it's negative, I still consider it highly suspect until proven otherwise, until proven otherwise. Treatment, this is so important. You're, you know, this is really important. You're only going to isolate and treat if you have the capacity to. And this is so important. By capacity, I don't just mean you, you know, you, uh, you know, you're able to put it on fluids. I mean, or able to provide supportive care. I mean, can you isolate it away from the rest of the population? Because if you can't, then you're doing a disservice to the whole population. So what treatment, the first step to treatment is always, do I have the capacity to treat pan luke? Do I have the capacity to treat parvo, ringworm, whatever that looks like? And the first question should always be, can I put this, do I have the capacity to how, humanely house this animal somewhere in appropriate housing with appropriate care and it's not uh, a, a, an exposure risk to other animals, right? That's always the first question. After that, it's going to be supportive care to, to get them through it. Sometimes you need pain meds, fluids, uh, et cetera, antibiotics. Usually after an animal's treated, they're going to stop shedding about two, two to four weeks, usually about two weeks. I always do this. If, if, if I have an animal that we got through pan loop, I snap test it at the end of treatment, too, to verify that it stopped shedding. There's a caveat there, right? I just told you a few slides ago that snap test isn't always accurate, right? And it's not that it's inaccurate, it's just that the cat might not be shedding at that time. So I always still do this extra snap test at the end to give everyone some peace of mind that, hey, it doesn't always capture it, but if I have a negative, I at least feel a little better that they stopped shedding. I'm gonna bathe and dry because, again, pan luke is really hardy. So I want to make sure I've bathed and dried that animal of any contaminants that could have been on his coat. I'm going to vaccinate. I'm going to keep vaccinating it as usual. Get it back onto its its protocol. Just briefly, we talked about decontamination. 
And then really important, decontaminate all points of contacts, including intake processing tables, any carriers you might have used, any restraint items, et cetera. Prevention is going to be vaccination immediately on intake. This is a really important one, guys. Don't randomly co-mingle litters. And the reason for that is you never know what a litter of kittens is harboring when it comes into your shelter. And so if I put a group of four kittens with a group of five kittens, I could have just exposed nine kittens to something like panluc or, or ringworm, right? So it's really dangerous to co-mingle litters. And I'm going to be honest and open. There are times where shelters commingle kittens. I'm going to say that one of the few times that's acceptable and OK is if you had those kittens out in foster. You monitored them for a, a quarantine or observation period. No one got sick during that time. You bring them back to the shelter for adoption. Maybe in those cases you can commingle because you, you basically observed them for a few weeks out in foster, right? Otherwise, it's so risky to put cats together from different litters because you never know who could harbor, who could be harboring what. If you do have like a singleton and you want to make sure that the singleton gets socialized, so you need to commingle it with another animal, right? That happens, right? That happens all the time. Some rules of thumb are going to be commingle it with the least amount of animals then. Don't put it in with a litter of five or six. In case it breaks with something, you just exposed five or six animals. So don't do that. Commingle it with maybe one or two other animals that are of its age and of its weight. And then ideally, only commingle it if you've been able to observe it for a few days, ideally two weeks, to make sure it doesn't break with something like pan loop, right? OK, provide vaccination. We talked about this earlier, so I won't go into it. I apologize. I only have five minutes, but I'm going to briefly go over ringworm. Feel free to touch base with me afterwards. We've all, we've all seen this, right? Ooh. OK. Ringworm is actually a fungus. Weird name, but it's actually a fungus. In shelters, it's mostly M. canis, Microsporum canis. Really contagious to other cats can be contagious to dogs, can be contagious to people, particularly people who are exposed to it a lot, like all of us, uh, children who are not as immune robust, and the elderly, or pregnant people, or uh, people on medications that cause immunosuppression. So important to remember that people can, of course, get ringworm. Uh, it's, uh, the ringworm spores are what's infective. That's what grows on the hair. That's what we're trying to treat when we uh, apply lime sulfur or other topical solutions to try to rid them of that ringworm. And then we treat them with oral medication as well to kind of treat them from the inside out as well. So both is just as important. Ringworm spores are very hardy. There's good and bad here. Ringworm, uh, I mentioned this earlier, ringworm isn't like mold. So if you have mold in your house, mold will multiply in your house. Ringworm won't. So it's a fungus, but it can only multiply on the host. So once it gets in the environment, it won't multiply, which is good, but it will sit there if you don't appropriately decontaminate it, right? Any cat, and, and I'll tell you that the ringworm outbreaks I've worked on at shelters, it was always a situation of the shelter was crowded, there were lots of underage kittens, uh, maybe mamas with kittens, so a lot of susceptible animals in a small, tight space. That's almost always the biggest risk factor. Kittens are most at risk because they're not as immune robust. And then kitten season is interesting. The warmer weather, the humid weather, the reason cats get infected with ringworm is they are exposed to it, they're exposed to the spores, and then there's some type of micro trauma on the skin that causes those spores to get in. And microtrauma can even be humidity, you know, humidity causing kind of microabrasions. And that's why we actually see more ringworm during warmer, humid seasons. We've all seen different variations, right? Any of this could be ringworm. These are all actually true, true uh, ringworm infections. Treatment is going to be oral medication to treat from the inside out, and then topical treatment. And many of you might be involved with this, because I've worked with lots of shelters where volunteers, if we didn't have volunteers, we would not be able to handle ringworm. Um, 
So really important that when we do tropical treatment at, at the shelter at home, uh, what we're doing is we're trying to reduce environmental contamination and we're trying to uh, cleanse them of those spores off their coat. That's the most important part there. This is important too. This is not a dip. We used to call it a dip forever, right? So we used to. We used to fill up a sink or a bucket with the right solution or concentration of lime sulfur and we would dip the cats. But nowadays we know that we don't want to dip because if I have a big solution of lime sulfur and I'm dipping every cat, then I'm cross-contaminating every cat as well, right? Uh, so really important that nowadays we reach for things like the garden rose sprayer to, to spray down, gently spray down every kitten, take a rag and make sure you get those places on the face that are hard to get with the sprayer. Because I, I will tell you that the face, and you all probably know this too, the face is where uh, the lesions typically last the longest because we don't get the face as well. So always important to take a rag and wipe lime sulfur over the face. Typically takes four, at least four weeks. After you know, med staff has cleared them, always one more topical treatment before you introduce them back to the general population to cleanse their coat. Decontamination, I spoke about this morning, but the most important is the cleaning part. Mechanically removing spores from the environment is the most important part. If you need a vacuum or if you need to clean floors, you don't ever want to use a broom. You don't ever want to do anything that can aerosolize or make the spores airborne. You want to use something like a Swiffer because it's electrostatic or a vacuum. And then if it's a vacuum with the bag, you would just throw the bag out, right? Or the canister, you'd empty it out. And then I put the rescue dilution here, but we now know that other products will work too as long as you do the really good cleaning component first. And then prevention is going to be screen for it at intake. That's the best way. Thanks, guys. Here's my email. Thank you.